miles. There were a couple tricky sections in Gurney, otherwise a beautiful ride in from Lake Geneva. And I was still able to telework starting at 10 a.m. until late in the evening when I was checking your email. Uh, the Chicago minimum wage and paid sick leave ordinance amended by city council in 2019. The minimum wage increase goes into effect July 1, 2020. We've received a series of questions lately about the different classes of workers, the size of the employer, where employees are working. Very interesting. One that I got just before I came in now was that what if the workers normally you're stationed in milwaukee you're in st louis you're in some other place but because of the pandemic the workers are performing the work here in chicago so they're teleworking but the work is done here in chicago and the answer is if they're working in chicago and they meet the definition of a covered employee um they're working here in Chicago. If they're working in Texas, they're not working in Texas. So employers should be mindful of where their employees are working um, to determine whether or not the Fair Work Week ordinance applies. Now that's not a minimum wage question, um, but I guess it could be a minimum wage question. If you perform majority of your work in Chicago, you might be due the minimum wage. So to back up and slow down, um, we drafted uh, minimum wage rules. We put those out for public comment. There were many commenters. We reviewed the comments. We came up with final rules, posted those. We've been hosting webinars Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. We've had online office apps Fridays at 2 p.m. So Jill, again, you, Jill asks, other rates an employee might receive. Um, the question then becomes, are we talking about predictability pay? This is not the Fair Work Week ordinance um, session, Jill. If you would save your questions for tomorrow and come into the Fair Work Week ordinance question and answer, I'd be happy to answer those because I think it requires moving through the ordinance to show you the different sections that might apply. But thank you for your question. All right, so the minimum wage. In the, uh, just a note here, in the minimum wage ordinance, the word W is capitalized. Lawyers know this, but other people who are here might say, why is it capitalized? When you see word employee with a capital C, capital E, you see employer or employee with a capital E, that means, oh, that's a term of art. I need to go to the definitional section. If it's a small e for employee, then, it, then we're not talking about the definition of an employee, we're talking about any employee. Uh, fielded a couple questions about that for purposes of determining whether or not we have enough covered employees. And so then we look at how many of those are covered employees, how many of those might be employees, but not covered employees for the purposes of determining if the Fair Work Week applies or by determining how many employees work in the city of Chicago under the minimum wage. So we have 20 employees total, but, uh, well, no, I'm sorry, we have 25 total, but we only have 10 who meet the definition of covered employee under the minimum wage. So is that 1350 or 14 on July 1st? And the answer is, we'll get to that. Minimum wage sets the minimum wage. Wage being a term of art, this should be close paren. Two, it guarantees accrual and use of paid sick leave for covered employees. And that should be capitalized. That should be capital C, capital E. It prohibits retaliation. And four, it has the ability, it, it allows people the ability to submit complaints to the Office of Labor Standards. And people call 311 often. 
and they make complaints. And so even during the pandemic, we had uh, hair salon, uh, person on Sedgwick had some minimum wage violations was there was a winding down of business. There was a paid sick leave violations alleged. There were minimum wage violations where people were not getting paid. Understandably, some people had no money to pay people with. So, you know, businesses shut down. Things were very rushed as businesses reopen. Now we turn again to ensure that workers are protected in Chicago um, from this power dynamic where the employees are not in a position of power compared to the employer. So I thought it might help to just show how the ordinance changed. First off, the definition of employer in the 2017 Chicago minimum wage and paid sick leave ordinance to the 2019 amendment that goes into effect next week. And note that the red is the new and final version. The strike through are the sections that were eliminated. So employer means a person who gainfully employs at least one employee. For purposes of minimum wage, if you gainfully employ at least one employee, you could be an employer. Note, what we eliminated is more important than this narrow definition. One, maintain a business facility within the geographic boundaries of the city. So it used to be that you had to have a you had to be located in the city of Chicago. What happens though? There were those who would set up on the periphery of the city, send their employees to the city and pay them less. Those people were doing all of their work in the city, yet they were benefiting from the state minimum wage, paying workers much less and sending workers into the city. Those people were working in the city of Chicago. So now if you're on the border shipping your workers into the city of Chicago, you need to pay them the Chicago minimum wage. Two be subject to one or more of the license requirements in Title IV. So if, and only if you had a business license and you were on the border, or you did not have a business license, you might not be subject to the minimum wage requirements of the city of Chicago. So we just stripped it down. Employer means a person who gainfully employs at least one employee. Gone are the days where employees uh, kind of suffered from different wage rates depending on the address of their employer. Yet they would do all their work in the city of Chicago. Same thing happens. There is kind of a, you know, if you're an HR professional, if you're an attorney, if you're someone who's advising clients, know that at the city uh Chicago O'Hare, there are certain contractors and concessionaires that have a different minimum wage rate. And that minimum wage rate is set. And on the river, the river walk for contractors and concessionaires, there is a different minimum wage. We're in the process of trying to get that information landed on the website, but it, it dates back to the kind of the same concept. If you're putting workers to work in, in and at O'Hare, Contractors who were from Ohio, Iowa, wherever, shipping workers to work at the O'Hare Airport, then they should benefit from the worker protections at O'Hare. And that is still the uh, uh, still ongoing. Some of the contracts are really old. Um, it's not a huge difference. It's just something to know. Let's get to employee. An employee means an individual that performs work for an employer in the capacity of employee as distinguished from a contractor pursuant to Internal Revenue Service guidelines. This section struck out the exceptions for domestic workers 
gratuities, occupation. However, we added it somewhere else. But the important note here is they have to be employees. We're not able to reach those that are independent contractors and require that they be paid the Chicago minimum wage. They have to be an employee. Purposes of the city of Chicago, at this time, um, I'm hoping at some point down the road, we could address the issue of misclassification. We're not able to. We could find uh, a pattern or practice where people were abusing the 1099 system, perhaps contact the Illinois Department of Labor, where they make determinations of classification. We could contact the Illinois Department of Employment Security, where they are able to determine the class of worker. They're, they're, they're more interested in a test to determine whether or not someone is an employee as opposed to an independent contractor. At this time, the city does not have that power. From covered employees, as I said, what about domestic workers? The previous slide struck them out. Are we no longer, what, what wage do we pay domestic workers? Well, covered employee does not include an individual permitted to work for an employer who has fewer than four, with the exception that, it's like an exception to an exception, it's like a double negative, all domestic workers, including domestic workers employed by employers with fewer than four, shall be covered employees if the individual meets the other requirements. So domestic workers move to class two, or cl I call it class two, class three, but they go to the tiering of sizes. If it's four to 20, it could be 1350 as a minimum wage. If it's 21 or more employees, it could be uh, $14 an hour on July 1st. That moves them from the exception to the rule to one of the classes based on employer size. Domestic workers employed by employers with fewer than four shall be covered employee, employees if they meet the other requirements. How do I know this is an attempt at a hypothetical, like a fact pattern, an illustrative example. How do I know if I'm a covered employee in regard to the minimum wage? Any employee is covered if in any two-week period, the person works at least two hours while physically present in the city of Chicago. For example, the question I got via email, uh, these workers, they're teleworking from Chicago. Do I have to pay them the minimum wage? We're from, you know, Tuscaloosa. I think Tuscaloosa is Alabama. We're from Indian No Place, Indianapolis, Indiana. In any two-week work period, they work at least two hours for an employer while physically present in Chicago. They could be considered a covered employee. It's a stretch, I know. But it's the law, and we have the power to protect those that work in Chicago. Cover, and this is from the ordinance down below. A covered employee means an employee who, in any particular two-week period, performs at least two hours of work for an employer while physically present within the geographic boundaries of the city. No, time spent traveling in Chicago that is compensated time, a delivery person is considered work in Chicago. However, time spent traveling in Chicago that's uncompensated time is not considered work. For purposes, sorry, for purposes of this definition, time spent traveling in the city that's compensated time, including but not limited to deliveries, Sales calls, travel related to other business activity taking place within the city shall constitute work while physically present within the geographic boundaries of the city. However, 
Time spent traveling in the city that's uncompensated. Commuting time shall not constitute work while physically present within the geographic boundaries of the city. Exceptions. Wait, did they cut out my slide? Where's my slide? Oh, no, they cut it out. Sometimes you put a draft together and someone doesn't like your... Let me see if it's in here. Ah, it's there. Never mind. Let's say exceptions to the definition of covered employee. Anyone working for an employer with fewer than four employees except domestic workers is an exception to the minimum wage requirement. So you're required to pay them either 13, 50, or 14 based on the size. If you have less than four, you don't have to pay the minimum wage. However, then you default to the state minimum wage. And some have asked as recently as a few minutes ago via email, what about the Cook County minimum wage? I can't speak to what the Cook County minimum wage is. And I, the county is large and wide. So if you believe that I'm not in the city, but I'm in a county, I need to pay the county minimum wage, then you need to look into that. I do not have a working relationship with those that enforce the minimum wage of the county of Cook. That's not to say I would like to have a relationship with them, but I just don't at this time. Outside sales, and I say salesperson, but according to federal law, they say salesman. Forgive me. I'm sorry. They're just not from this millennia. <laughs> if you're an outside salesman, under that definition, you probably know what an outside salesman is. If, if it peaks, this is what I do, then... If you meet that definition of an outside salesman, you are an exception to the definition of covered employee. You're not due the minimum wage. And I think it's, you know, like a, what are they? they sell knives and pots and pans and encyclopedias. We had a set of encyclopedias when I was little. I don't know if they're, I don't know what they were. Not encyclopedias. It was like a, I don't know, a series of books. Members of a religious corporation or organization are not required to be paid the minimum wage. That might include, but not be limited to, Catholic churches, uh, like if the Seventh-day Adventists or other organizations, like let's say, for example, Baha I was on a bike ride this weekend, I, I keep talking about it, but the Baha'i Baha Temple has workers there. If they are members of a religious corporation or organization, they might be accepted from being paid the minimum wage. That's probably not in the city of Chicago, the Baha'i Temple, but let's say they have an office. Or, for example, Moody Bible. Members of religious corporation or organization are exempt from the minimum wage requirement. Four, a student um, – before we go on, Don asks, how do you determine large employer over 21 employees? Is that employees for the entire year on payroll for that week? Once you have over 21, are you always a large employer? You know, for purposes of the fair work week, we look at fluctuations uh, week by week. You know, for example, if a, re uh, a manufacturing has 110 employees during peak business, but in the summer they shut down, and they don't have 100 and they don't have 50 covered employees, if you don't have 21 employees, then you might not meet the definition of, um, I mean, it's really definitional, Don. So we determine it. I guess we could break it down week by week. Uh, so you could fall down to, what is it, 4 to 20? Uh, or you could fall under 4. Let's say an ice cream shop booms to 50 employees in the summer. Are we going to require them in winter when it's just mom and dad working there too? Well, they're not employees. Mom, dad, and two kids who kind of maintain the stock and inventory and do mail order in the winter, we wouldn't enforce the minimum wage on them then if they were just down to two. So we do break it down week by week. Uh, back to this. Thank you for the question, Don. 
um, a student at an Illinois college or university who's covered on the Fair Labor Standards Act. So that's definitional. I would refer to the actual ordinance to get complete, but I think it comes out of the Illinois minimum wage law. Unfortunately, in the minimum wage and paid sick leave ordinance, it refers to Illinois minimum wage law. And you kind of, if you work in this area a lot, you kind of have to have both up all the time. Let me get the minimum wage ordinance for the section on minimum wage. Oh, I can't find it at this time, but if it's a student at Illinois College University covered on the FS, FLSA, they're accepted. If you work for a motor carrier, carrier, it, I believe it's, it just struck out the ability for a city to use the um, home rule to cover motor carriers because it really moves in interstate commerce, so it's more federal in nature, let's let the feds govern it. A camp counselor at a day camp, if paid a stipend, not subject to and there are not many of those working at a day camp in the city of Chicago under a stipend in the summer, especially now. But that's probably not going to happen this summer. Working for any government entity other than the city and sister agencies. So that's a very narrow list. Uh, you probably know who you are if that's the case. No longer exceptions. So. These were stricken. We decided that I was in uh, Lake Geneva this weekend, and there was a wonderful coffee shop there, and they had some disabled workers uh, facilitating. One of them gave me a mask, scolded me because we were social distancing with family. However, when we went to the store, I didn't have, and I was quickly handed a mask. Uh, so they were kind of staged throughout the store. Used to be that. Um, they were allowed to pay those workers less than the minimum wage. That's no longer the case. If you're at a restaurant or some other entity in the city of Chicago, those disabled workers will be paid the full minimum wage uh, under the ordinance. Two, subsidized temporary youth employment programs subsidized transitional employment programs. The thought was previously, well, you know, these are subsidized. We'd like to employ more temporary youth in the summer. We'd like to get more people in the transitional employment program, but the, the countervailing uh, view is that let's pay those people the full minimum wage. So they were stricken as an exception. And those people are paid the full minimum wage, depending on the size of the employer, for remedial education programs, full minimum wage. For learners, which is a term of art related to, it's kind of like apprenticeship programs. If you're a learner, it's a very defined program. I think it's in the minimum wage law, but I'm not sure. I could find it. Put that in there. So I've referred to the minimum wage law, meaning the Illinois minimum wage law. It can be found at eight. 20 ILCS 105 forward slash one. There is a link here. It's pretty easy to find. That link probably doesn't work, so I don't know that you should click on it. Uh, no, it probably won't if you click on it, but that is the link. Uh, you just go to the Illinois General Assembly website or you just type in minimum wage law 820 ILCS 105. You probably pull it up. Um, the font is in Courier or something, so if you want to pull it down and look at it, move it to Word so you have it and it's more searchable, recommend saving it as a Word document. So uh, when, when we have those that the 
the less than four employees, the minimum wage, the defaults in Illinois, these are the Illinois Department of Labor published hourly minimum wage rates by year. For minimum wage, effective July 1, 2020, the state minimum wage is $10. It was $9.25 back in January, moved to 10 July 1st. The tipped wage was $5.55 in January, moved to 6 For youth, it was 8 It's going to be 8 and Basically, they're on a ramp to 15 but it's going to take a little while. And the city has advanced the ramp because we're interested in giving people a livable wage, a living wage, if you call it that, and try to, you know, move the cycle and the cycle of poverty is the goal of the city of Chicago. Um, also in the minimum wage ordinance, you'll see these two words defined. Um, gratuities means voluntary monetary contributions to an employee from a guest, patron or customer in connection with services rendered that, you know, we refer to the definitions in minimum wage law. So I cut them and put them here. Occupations means an industry, trade, business, or class of work in which employees are gainfully employees, employed. So this is the top portion of the new public notice. We put the notice, now I will say that in the bottom of the notice, as those wiser than me have figured out, it says good through June 30. So we are trying to get that updated public notice and strike out that June 30 part through review and updated. Uh, I'm hoping by the end of the day tomorrow, I will keep my expectations low. Um, but this just breaks it down and in more of a visual format, large employers with 21 or more employees so that, for Don's question, 21 or more employees, then you default to the 13, I'm sorry, 14 and July 15, July 21, and 2022, we'll talk about in a minute. For smaller employers, 4 to 20, youth workers were at 8, they're going to 10 and 11, everyone is moving to a ramp of 15 after that, the consumer price index will apply. We will be required to publish on or before a certain date, that was like June something, the new minimum wage on our website. Now for tipped workers, um, there are different minimum wages. And for youth, right now there's no minimum wage. In July, it goes to six. In July 2021, stays, it moves to 660. Note that tipped workers, if they don't make the minimum wage with tips, the employer has to make up the difference. Not all employers know that, so it's not worth, I mean, it's worth restating. So here, because I've been getting this question, and it, people send me, uh, the following question say, listen, I was looking at the ordinance and it says beginning July 1, 2020, that there shall be no city minimum wage increase in any year when the employment rate in Chicago for the preceding year is calculated by the Illinois Department of Employment Security was equal to or greater than 8.5%. However, the minimum wage is now posted so for July 1, 2020, it's $14. July 1, 2021, it's $15. This section about 8.5% um, 8 8 was to apply for 2020. That will be the case in 2022 prospectively. So after that, any year after July 1, 2022, that there shall, uh, where there is uh, the unemployment rate in Chicago for the preceding year is calculated by the IDES was equal to or greater than 8.5%. There would be no minimum wage increase 
if it were found that the increase was greater than 8.5%. However, for July 1, 2020, $14 an hour for 21 or more employees, $13.50 for 5 to 20, I'm sorry, 4 to 20 employees. That is the most commonly asked question. Um, and I've got a stock cut and paste response for people when they send that to me. I'm just going to leave that up there a minute for edification. We advance. Oh, my computer is probably going to die before we're done. So if I suddenly cut out, you'll realize that my computer's dead. Just kidding. No, that's true. Employers must keep records regarding commissioned employees. Commissions or commissions plus base wage must equal at least the minimum wage. Some commissioned employees will meet the definition of outside salesmen aka outside salespersons. I have been working on one particular uh, question regarding commissions and the minimum wage for an employer. I need to get back to them about it. So if you're on here, know that I'm thinking about you and trying to get that done. Overtime rates are calculated by the regular minimum wage multiplied by 1.5 over time. When do tip workers have to be compensated by their employers if their tips plus wage did not equal at least the minimum wage? That should be done at least by the next pay period. However, you know, employers don't always monitor tips in your paycheck. You know, the manager, life is busy at the restaurant. Life is busy wherever where you're making tips, at the patio or, you know, with all these, if you're in the, a restaurant near uh, a venue that hosts a lot of events. For example, soccer games are coming back on. There might be tipped workers going, working. That used to be the case much more when the patio and restaurant season was booming. However, my point is that not all Employers know that their tipped workers are not making the full minimum wage. It's incumbent on the employee to say, hey, listen, I don't know if you noticed, but I, I didn't make any tips this week. I had an ice cream parlor worker call last, I don't know, it was some point in the not so distant past, pre-pandemic, and said, I'm not making the minimum wage at the ice cream parlor. I think he called when I was like freezing out. I say, okay. And my employer told me, well, that's not my fault. And what happens is in some businesses, there's a Danish or pastry shop. I don't want to name it, but they use a jar. And so the, the owner pays everybody on a tipped wage. And the workers are like, listen, we share a tip jar. No one ever throws any money in the tip jar. So we're paid like 680 or 625 but we never make. $13 based on the tip jar. It's not fair. And here's how it works. The, if one person's working the register, right, and the other person is like helping the customer, the register doesn't figure out who was helping the customer and assign any tip that comes in to that person. The tip is placed in a pool and distributed among employees. It really didn't sound fair. So you could believe that our investigation into that little pastry shop will go at minimum wage uh, and try to bring the full, uh, full force and effect of the law to bear. And the ice cream shop employee, I believe he talked to his boss and said, listen, I, I talked to the Office of Labor Standards, said where I don't make enough to meet the minimum wage, you should supplement my income. The, a complaint was never made to 311, so I, I'm assuming the employer did the right thing and made it up. Okay. What happens 
I've already answered this. I could go back to that slide, but generally the unemployment rate doesn't exceed 8.5%. I'm sorry, yeah, unemployment rate for the preceding year doesn't it usually exceed 8.5%, but we are in new territory. For July 1, 2020, we're set. For July 1, 2021, we're set. However, beginning July 2022, and on every July 1st thereafter, if the CPI increases more than 2.5%, then it's the minimum wage increase would be capped at 2.5%, and there'll be no minimum wage increase in any year where the unemployment rate is calculated by IDES was equal to or greater than 8.5%. Now, just a couple comments on paid sick leave. Paid sick leave involves accrual. It involves accrual in whole hour increments. So if you work at a job site and the accruals come in at 0 0.25, 0 0.26 an hour, you work 30 hours, you're supposed to get whole hour increments. So you would get one hour, two hour, three hours, of paid sick leave, not 0 0.25, 0 0.75, 0 0.68. The hours should be rounded or shown so that a person knows to the whole hour how much paid sick leave they have. Accrual. Carryover is really important in that based on whatever your fiscal year is, at the end of the year, an employee can carry over one half of their hours. So if you had 40, you could carry 20. If you had 20, you could carry over 10. Some employers front load the entire year up front. They say, listen, you get 40 at the beginning of every year. So if you rolled over 10, it doesn't matter. It doesn't roll over to get 50 unless they have a policy you could use 50. But they're at a minimum required to give you 40. So they would just give you 40, let you use 40, and then that would be that. The paid sick leave ordinance also provides methods for usage of paid sick leave. Note, however, that in the minimum wage ordinance, that, that section that was stricken and they came in in 2019 and they amended it to change the minimum wage and the different classes of workers, this is a cut and paste from parts of it. But if you look for the new minimum wage ordinance, you'll get a PDF and it shows that certain sections were stricken. That's where there's a halfway line through. And then other sections were underlined. They were added, um, like the ones up top were added completely. Inadvertently, there was a Scrivener's error. And that Scrivener's error, it was discovered that section 124.010 contained a Scrivener's error. I love saying that. That erroneously removed groups from previously subject that were previously subject to paid sick leave of the minimum wage and paid sick leave ordinance. Accordingly, section 124.010 of the MCC is hereby amended by adding the language underscored and by deleting the language struck through. So basically say, hey, listen, we accidentally excluded certain people who would be covered under paid sick leave. Anybody who works in the city of Chicago who's a covered employee shall get paid sick leave. And that's what the Scrivener's error fixed. Employees who work in the following categories shall be covered employees under 124045, which is the paid sick leave section of the ordinance. So paid sick leave starts in a municipal code in 124.050.045, paid sick leave. As an outside salesman, as a member of a religious corporation, at and employed by an accredited Illinois college or university at which the individual is a student who is covered under the FLSA as amended, D, for a motor carrier 
and with respect to whom the Secretary of Transportation has the power to establish qualifications and maximum of hours of service under the provisions of Title 49. <laughs> USC of the state of Illinois under section 18B, 105, title 92, the Illinois, blah, 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 blah. So certain, we inadvertently excluded certain classes. Those people are now included under paid sick leave coverage. Who qualifies for paid sick leave? Let's back up a little bit. Let's just go back to the eligibility covered employees, any employee that works 80 hours for an employee within any 120 day period. So it's not that you have to cross the threshold of 120 days, it's that you work 80 hours within a 120 day period. Employees must be able to use their paid sick leave by the 180th calendar day following the commencement of employment. There is no consideration of the number of workers an employer employs for PSL. I do see a question, let me get to it. If I can find it, uh, there it is. So the question is a good one. Can you please clarify the payout of paid sick leave in our whole hour increments? If an employee is scheduled an eight hour day and they only have 1.48 hours accrued, we can only pay them one hour? Well, I, I think it, it kind of assumes something that shouldn't be there. If, they've, if they either accrue one hour or two hours, they don't accrue 1.48. So you can really, a spreadsheet is what determines how they accrue, what you show the worker. So I would just, rather than show 1.48, it's either one or two round. So what they have available, if we do a subpoena, we get your records and I've got 1.48 hours, it could be a violation because it's supposed to be in a whole hour increment. So behind the spreadsheet, the mathematical setup of what hours you accrue should be in a whole hour increment. So that person would only have one hour of accrued paid sick leave. So I guess the answer is yes to your question. Uh, so employees must be able to use their paid sick leave 180th calendar day, no consideration of workers and employer employees for PSL. Employees begin accruing paid sick leave the first calendar day after the first day of employment. They accrue or earn one hour of paid sick leave for every 40 hours worked in hourly increments. That's that hourly increment. So if I work 35, it might be a fraction, but then what you show or what is established as accrued becomes a whole hour increment. I know it doesn't it's kind of tedious. It's almost negligible as far as the scheme of things. And the spreadsheet doesn't see whole hour increments easily, but that is how, and that is what we expect. And I can tell you nine out of 10 cases we get for paid sick leave, a spreadsheet shows fractions. The real concern, the real concern is whether or not people are allowed to take, take paid sick leave. This is not a violation we would be seeking millions of dollars in damages over. The real issue is, are people accruing? And when they ask for time off, are you paying them? If you're denying them time off, did you give them a basis for it? Or are they taking time off and they're not getting paid at all? So I have sick time, I ask for it off. You say, yeah, take it off, but I'm not paying you. You don't get any paid sick leave a complete denial of paid sick leave when you've earned the hours. Some people do not tell their employees they have paid sick leave. So it goes on for years and then we discover it. And now we've got to go back years and determine of paid sick leave that should have been given, how many people took off and were not given any pay, which is a lot of work. So as I said earlier, 
our investigators are knee deep uh, up to the up to the gills in minimum wage and paid sick leave cases, culling through wage records to do analysis over do we have a paid sick leave violation or not? Paid sick leave is very labor intensive because we contact employees. We get one complaint, one complaint about a paid sick leave violation, or for example, at that Danish place, I'm not making minimum wage and my employer won't make up the difference. There's some stupid tip jar and we're dividing the tips. Nobody ever makes minimum wage and the employer really just like, He's so arrogant and above it all, he's such a master chef that he's not paying us. And everyone's too scared to say anything. We don't identify that one employee, we look to all employees because if it's happening to one, odds are it's a company-wide practice. And to be honest, some people had no idea. I don't know why, but some people have no idea that there's a minimum wage in the city of Chicago or paid sick leave in the city of Chicago or workers are too scared to complain about the fact that they know what happens, but it hasn't. And they say, oh my gosh, this is so, we're so sorry. We're, we didn't realize we were not paying the correct minimum wage. So let's fix it. Some people rely on the payroll company each year. So for example, July 1st comes, you assume the payroll company has adjusted payroll so that people are paid the new minimum wage. Well, the payroll company doesn't do their job. You had, you're just working. You're the manager, you're the owner, you're paying this payroll company to do their business for you, uh, to your business for you. It could be a, a, a defect that is cured. Mea copa, I'll pay these people back. Uh, one hour paid sick leave, 40 hours work, up to 40 hours of benefit year, consecutive 12 month period. Hours worked outside Chicago don't count toward paid sick leave, much to the consternation of some. So, eligible covered employees can use up to 40 hours of Family Medical Leave Act uh, or 40 hours of paid sick leave during any benefit year. Just let me qualify by saying Family Medical Leave Act is very technical. I'm not the regulator of Family Medical Leave Act. You probably have an HR professional. You are an HR professional. If you're a worker, there's someone in the HR shop who understands Fem Family Medical Leave Act. People apply for it, they're approved. People apply for it, they're denied. You can use it, not use it. It's very technical. For purposes of the city of Chicago, you could carry over as many as 40 hours uh, of Family Medical Leave Act hours and only use them as family medical leave. So paid sick leave, you can carry over 20. For family Medical Leave Act, you can carry over up to 40 if earned. During the first benefit year, accrual up to 40 of PSL, all of which can be used for Family Medical Leave Act. The carryover of 40 hours for Family Medical Leave Act purposes, plus half of the unused paid sick leave up to 20 hours. So there's a total potential carryover of 60 hours. But know that FMLA is technical, who applies for and gets it and has administered, that is not before the Office of Labor Standards. We just look to whether or not it's accrued, whether or not it's handled, whether or not it's granted. It could be a separate violation. But those in that area of the law are keenly prepared for those questions and answers. All right. When the employee is ill or injured or receiving medical care, treatment diagnosis, diagnosis or preventative care, or a member of their family is ill or injured, or they must care for a family member receiving medical care, treatment, diagnosis, or preventative medical care. That's FMLA. Oh, I'm sorry. That is, that's just straight paid sick leave. When the employee is ill, receiving medical care, treatment, diagnosis, preventative care, or a member of their family is ill, injured, or they must care for a family member receiving medical care, treatment, diagnosis, preventative, 
medical care. No, paid sick leave can also be used if the employee or a member of their family is the victim of domestic violence or a sex offense. Good law. Two, the place of business is closed by order of a public official due to a public health emergency. Well, it sounds like we're in one of those right now. Three, they need to care for a child whose school or place of care has been closed by order of a public official due to a public health emergency. Sounds like now. Paid sick leave can be used to take care of a child if your business is closed due to public health emergency. Note that the definition of family member is very broad. Family member means a covered employee's child, legal guardian, or ward, spouse under the laws of any state, domestic partner, parent, spouse or domestic partner's parent, sibling, grandparent, grandchild, or any other individual related by blood or whose close association with the employee is the equivalent of a family relationship. A child includes not only a biological relationship, or these terms bother me, but also a relationship resulting from an adoption, step relationship, and or foster care relationship, or a child to whom the employee stands in loco parentis. If you're acting as the parent of some child, you could enjoy protection of the ordinance because you are defined or meet the definition of family member. A parent includes a biological, foster, step parent, or adoptive parent, or legal guardian, a guardian of an employee, or a person who stood in loco parentis when the employee was a minor child. This kind of touches the reality of many in the city of Chicago to allow workers to take care of their families under the paid sick leave ordinance. When does PSL have to be paid? No later than the next regular pay payroll period after it was used. So you take a sick day, you should be paid that amount as if you worked. It's not rocket science. Pay them. Let them take their paid sick leave. And some employers do this. They say, oh, no, everybody at our, everybody at our business gets paid sick leave. I'll show you. They send me the spreadsheets. I get a subpoena. Everybody's getting accruals. Accruals. And they're getting whole hour accruals. All across. 120 employees at the manufacturing site, retail, whatever, all getting paid sick leave. I look to how many hours were used. Zero through 120 employees, not one of them is ever using the paid sick leave. So the question becomes, is that a, a, a spreadsheet where you just add a column and based on the hours, you figure out how to mathematically accrue paid sick leave, but nobody's ever taken paid sick leave because either you haven't granted it or you haven't paid it out. Yeah, that's like a, that should be like falsification of records should be a violation under the minimum wage and paid sick leave ordinance, but I don't go there. We just investigate the facts we're given. And if we talk to employees and they produce wage records that show they took days off and were not paid, then we approach it that way. Employers do not have to pay out unpaid, unused paid sick leave upon termination, resignation, retirement, which caused a lot of people stress. I have paid sick leave. It shows up on my paycheck. The business shuts down. They terminate you. You resign, you retire. You don't have to pay out paid sick leave during a pandemic. We laid everybody off. I'm not paying anybody up. And you don't have, well, unfortunately, you don't have to uh, document 
give those people back those hours after resignation, retirement, layoff, when they return. Yeah, tricky. So we're at the 302 mark, 62 minutes in. I hope I've covered enough information. Um, Don, I think if your employee counts, uh, you have to determine that yourself. Figure out which wage is proper. To be safe, wouldn't you want to pay them the minimum wage? Because if you ever did it incorrectly, we could find a violation each day for each employee. Five hundred to one thousand dollars in each violation, and each violation is one day at a time for each employee. So determine your employee count and pay them at the rate they should be paid. That didn't help. I'm sorry. Uh, there is one more question before we go. I'll ask it. We can pay sick leave out once they hit. 180 days on the job, correct. I do think that it's within, you could probably pay it before, but you can pay it out once they hit 180 days on the job. So we'll have an office hours question and answer. So I know that someone showed up and asked some really good questions about the Fair Work Week. Join us tomorrow at 2. There'll be an open session. I plan on going into self-scheduling tomorrow for a little while because I tried to get that on Tuesday and it was not able. I wanna thank you for attending. Uh, I'd like to be respectful of your time and your busy schedules, let you get back to work or teleworking, which is really the same thing. Uh, get back to whatever you're doing. Um, I, I, we might continue on with these trainings because as businesses reopen, I get the sense that we're going to need to provide refreshers and updates and primers and give people information they need to come into compliance. And that's the goal. As businesses reopen, we're trying to get people into compliance, uh, trying to help them understand, move to kind of correct and educate and get people into compliance as opposed to penalizing behavior. Uh, uh, we're very mindful that this is one of the most trying and historically um, challenging situations we as a city have lived. So we're here for you as a resource. Um, if you have any questions that haven't been answered, you could email BACP labor standards at cityofchicago.org. BACP labor standards at cityofchicago.org. If you want to get a much faster answer, show up tomorrow and I'll be here to answer your questions from two o'clock on. So thank you all, I really appreciate it. I wish you the best, stay safe, and look out for upcoming webinars.